bom dia a todas e todos. Então, hoje a gente tem a satisfação de receber a Marina Leite, que está na Universidade da Califórnia, em Davis. É, vou falar um pouquinho da trajetória dela. Ela fez graduação em Química na Federal de Pernambuco. Aí ela foi para a Unicamp, fez o mestrado e o doutorado lá. Defineu o doutorado em 2007. Na verdade, o trabalho de pesquisa dela foi no laboratório de luz Synchrotron. A tese dela ganhou menção honrosa no prêmio SBF de teses de 2009. Depois ela foi para o um Instituto de Tecnologia da Califórnia, Caltech, fazer um pós-doc. Depois disso, ela passou alguns anos como professora na Universidade de Maryland e faz uns dois anos que ela está na Universidade da Califórnia, em Davis. É, e hoje ela vai falar para a gente sobre novos materiais para fotônica e é, energia renovável. Marina, muito obrigada por ter aceito o convite, ainda mais que são seis da manhã lá na Califórnia agora. Né? Então, agora é com você. É, obrigado. Obrigada, Carol. Muitíssimo obrigada pelo convite. Um prazer enorme ver as, alguns rostos aí conhecidos. E Liliana, eu quero ver você no final rapidinho, se você tiver tempo, a não ser que se desconecte. Então, é, como a Carol falou, faz um tempo que eu estou aqui nos Estados Unidos, então eu vou uh, começar me desculpando. Dizendo que eu vou ter que dar o um seminário em inglês, eu vou falar devagar e perguntas em português são muito bem-vindas, por favor, não deixem de fazer uma pergunta. E, de novo, eu peço me desculpas, eu, eu sempre achava que, assim, ah, como é que uma pessoa pode não dar um seminário em português? Mas, na verdade, faz muito, muito tempo que eu só penso em, em, em ciência e engenharia em inglês. Então, esse é o motivo. Mas, então, como Carol disse, faz dois anos que eu estou aqui na Universidade de Davis, Onde é que a gente fica? Esse slide que eu vou falar em português. A gente, na verdade, está perto de São Francisco, 20 minutos de Sacramento, está aqui a deles, e São Francisco está aqui. É uma região, eu diria que tem, é muito bem localizada do ponto de vista científico. A gente tem vários laboratórios nacionais, tem o SWAC na Stanford, tem o Laboratório Nacional o Lawrence Berkeley é, em Berkeley, né? tem também, claro, esse Berkeley, tem Sandia. E do ponto de vista pessoal, eu diria que tem vários atrativos nessa região também. Então, caso alguns estudantes estejam interessados em fazer é, é, um sanduíche ou um pós-doc, é, não deixe de entrar em contato comigo. Eu tive pessoas que vieram aqui no passado, que vieram pós-doc, que foi muito produtivo, que agora são professores, então tem funcionado muito bem. Então, agora eu vou mudar para inglês. Então, today I would like to present part of the work that my group has been doing in two different topics that are related to functional materials. One of them is related to optical materials, so I'll tell you how we've been uh, um, trying to advance the understanding of light-matter interactions and what is the purpose of doing so using metals, specifically coin-age metals such as gold, or silver, and copper. And I'll tell you in details what we've been doing with these um, three types of metals and the mixture between them. And then in the second part of my talk, I will focus on materials for solar cells, in particular, how we have been used the advanced scanning probe microscopy methods so that we can visualize dynamic processes in a, some of those materials, specifically highlight the perovskites. And I'll tell a little bit as a motivation why we care so much about those. So again, please do ask any questions at any point. Now, let's start with the, the work on photonics that we've been doing. First of all, as an intro slide, I would like to um, define what plasmonics is. So plasmonics is really um, the field that studied light matter interactions in metals. And essentially, the textbook picture here, what happens is that whenever we have an interface between a metal and air, if we shine light, and that's represented here by red, and you see here the direction of the X component of the electric field, what happens is that we can excite collective oscillations of electrons at the interface between the metal and the dielectric. Now, why, does, uh, but why do we care about that, right? The reason of why we care so much about that is because then we can actually have a very, very large electric field enhancement, meaning we can actually localize light in space. So what we can also do, if we have now, instead of a thin film configuration, but actually a nanostructure, and if again, we excite this metallic nanostructure with the light at a, at a certain rate of wavelength, we can actually promote so we localize the surface plasma resonance. So now again here, we can have the confinement of these electrons. And that's when we have the situation of this electric field enhancement. So literally, the electric field can increase in several orders of magnitude. And then if we can do that, we can actually have a really high light absorption. 
So ultimately, what we want to do when we work with the metallic ring films and nanostructures in my group is to essentially control the electromagnetic spectrum. Ideally, we want to be designing materials in which um, we can um, choose and select at what wavelength we can have a high or low light absorption or transmission and reflection. And this is super useful to make a series of a photonic device, and I'll show you a couple of examples in a moment. Now, historically, there has been an enormous amount of a really, really good work where people have um, managed to control light absorption by using uh, metallic nanostructures that have a variety of uh, geometry, size, and also by varying the medium in which these nanostructures are embedded, the metal that makes this building block itself. However, chemical composition has been a parameter that it has been, uh, I would say, somewhat overlooked. And then we decided to focus on that. And I will basically be telling you what has been our contribution on the field on that. Now, in terms of a few examples of what we can do with those metallic nanostructures, I'll show four to you right now. And these are um, um, results from other groups, okay? So basically, we can make use of metallic nanostructures to increase the photo current within solar cells. And if we do that, basically we can, uh, um, because of the contrasting refractive index between the metallic nanostructure and the dielectric layer that we have here, that it's an anti reflection coating, we can essentially increase the forward light scattering. So we can have a, a, a lot more light getting into the device, which is something that we want a lot of, in the case of a solar cell. We can also make structures for sensing, and we've done some work on that, not with nanostructures, but with films. We can also uh, create colors, and I'll show some examples of that. Actually, this is a different type of, uh, of material platform, and I'll tell you why we're working with those in particular in a moment. So we can basically um, give a color to glass by using metallic nanostructure with different aspect ratio and uh, um, different materials in general. And we can actually also make a, a really vivid colors for displays, which is something that we're also very interested in. Now, the work that uh, I'm going to share with you today is going to be heavily based on uh, these coin age metals, copper, silver, and gold. And the reason um, for that are, are the following. First of all, these uh, three metals, they have a somewhat similar bend structure, and I'll tell a little bit more about that in a second. They're quite similar, in fact. They all, they're all FCC, right? But there has been a, um, an enormous amount of work related to nanophotonics based on silver. This is a material that works uh, extremely well for plasmonics. And uh, they do have, a, um, at least for silver and gold, nearly identical lattice phase. So that's another advantage. So we thought this is a good model system to investigate and quantify how much can we tailor the permittivity of the materials, right, by using um, binary mixtures instead of a pure metal. And then to remind you all, right, and when I'm saying permittivity here, well, we can also think in terms of refractive index, right, but essentially we're going to be talking about the real and the imaginary part of the permittivity, okay, where epsilon 2, the imaginary part, is directly telling us how much light absorption we have within a material. So again, the ultimate goal here in the beginning was to build a library of uh, the optical response or the permittivity of uh, this binary mixture so that then we could provide an hour, uh, one, a database that can be useful for the design of more complex type of nanostructures. And then in our um, optical simulations, right, we then uh, have a realistic input because it turns out that the permittivity actually of these binary mixtures is very different than uh, the linear combination of these two metals, any of these two metals weighted by chemical composition. Now, so we started creating this library several years ago, and we did that by um, making samples. <laughs> so essentially, we do a co sputtering the position of uh, uh, two metals in this particular case. And we do that by um, controlling very carefully the chemical composition gradient that we have within a, one of those um, glass substrates. And I uh, apologize here for the lack of scale. These are glass substrates, they actually are four inch by six inch. So they're quite large, literally. Okay. And then um, um, once we uh, characterize the chemical composition very well, when we know we have a, 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 again, a, a very smooth gradient in chemical com composition, we can then go ahead and measure what we call ellipsometry. So when we measure ellipsometry, we're essentially combining transmission measurements and the reflection. And then uh, we have to model using mathematical function, what is the, the 
ultimate uh, uh, permittivity, again, epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 here, of the material that we have. In this case, we use the uh, B spine functions. You could use a general oscillator in case of a metal. There are different functions that you can use. And basically, we want to make sure our mathematical solution is not only correct, but of course has a physical meaning. So in that sense, we really need to make sure we enforce Kramer's chronic relation, which is something that we all learn in our EMM classes, right? So basically, there's quite a bit of data in this slide. I won't go into all the details, but I just want to highlight that um, what we've noticed here when measuring and modeling, right, measuring reflection and transmission and modeling the permittivity of uh, uh, silver and gold, what we did notice is that despite the fact that gold forms a solid solution, regardless of its chemical composition, this uh, uh, binary mixture forms a solid solution, meaning the enthalpy of formation is negative. Basically, what happens is that we do have a, quite a lot of variation in NK and it's very, very nonlinear. So for example, for a mixture that has a 50% of silver and gold, we did see that the permittivity, the imaginary part of the permittivity epsilon 2 actually achieves a, a minimum here that is below the one for the pure counterparts in the near infrared. So that can be very useful again to design a certain photonic device where we want um, very little light absorption. I mean, you want to minimize epsilon 2. Could be in a different situation now where, for example, we want to have a lot of light being absorbed by the, the material. So for example, when we design a super absorber, and I'll show an example of that in a few slides, then we actually want a really high epsilon 2. So, um, these, are, these are the results for um, gold and copper, so I won't get into any details uh, on that because due to time. And then for copper silver, this is a really interesting system because we actually do not easily form a solid solution. It requires quenching and decreasing the temperature very quickly after the deposition. Um, however, this is really um, useful for us again to show that we can actually identify, so okay, um, if you took us a, a, a grad level course on solid state physics, you might remember that uh, um, all these uh, electronic transitions, right, that we see in the material, we can actually, within a solid a matter specifically, we can actually translate that into the epsilon 2 here, this type of measurement. So there's a lot of analysis that go into, you know, if we have a, um, a shift here, you know, in the curve, right, a change, a, a, an abrupt change in the value of epsilon 2, it corresponds to a certain electronic transition. You can actually trace that back. And I'll show to you um, some of the work that we've done on that as well. Now, in order to corroborate these ellipsometry measurements, because as you can imagine, we have to rely on, a, on the model, right, as I mentioned a few times, we then um, can do a, a very complementary type of measurement, which is called um, a measurement of a surface plasma polariton using something that we call Kretschmann configuration. And basically what we do now, we actually scan as a function of angle, um, this uh, metal um, dielectric interface, and look for an angle in which we have a minimum in reflection. So these measurements here and the calculation, they show us that first of all, we do have a very good agreement between the two. Second of all, how smoothly in the case of silver and gold, this minimum in reflection occurs. And then uh, um, for the other combinations, that's uh, uh, not so smooth, right? We see that we have a quite a bit of loss here. So this requires a little bit more of optimization with respect to the thickness of these films as well as uh, on the roughness of the film, so basically on the fabrication uh, step. But I think our goal here was not necessarily to show an optimized deep in reflection, but actually how we can attune that. And then for copper and silver, again, we see that the system doesn't behave as well. You know, there's a bit of noise because there is actually more loss uh, probably, right, since this data has been shown here normalized. But again, the position that we need the internal angle in which the minimum reflection occurs agrees very well with our calculations. So um, if we now put these two measurements together, the ellipsometry measurements and uh, um, the, the SPP measurements that I've just shown to you, the surface plasma polariton, and then I'm representing the second one by the triangles here, so there's a prism for that, and the ellipsometry valid of um, um, solid square. If we do that for at least the one angle, meaning 637 nanometers here, we see a very good agreement between the two. Now let's focus again on silver and gold, and let me tell you that, um, we can see that the behavior as a function of chemical composition here for um, this a binary mixture is a very nonlinear, right? And we're wondering what's causing that. So then um, what we did in order to understand further what is the origin, right, of this optical behavior that we're seeing, we actually came up with uh, Alexander Russia in a, a um, EFT, 
in Sao Paulo, and uh, uh, he's a, a very good friend of back from grad school, and it's been a delight to collaborate with him so often. It's, it's been a really, really a, a, a true pleasure, and um, I've been learning a lot, I should say. So basically, um, what we did here, we realized that we needed to calculate actually the dense structure for this binary mixture. So again, as an example, I'm showing to you here silver and gold, and here's what we see. For pure silver and pure gold, here in red and black, respectively, we're talking about the textbook figure. Okay, so let's focus on the gamma point. That's enough for us to learn a lot about what's going on. So basically here you can see uh, the Fermi, uh, um, what we can see actually here is that as we increase the amount of gold, right? So basically the position of the D band moves towards the Fermi level. So that's essentially what we're seeing. Now, besides that, you can see a break in degeneracy as expected in several of these electronic states because now we have a, a different elements, right? Uh, uh, constituting the unit cell. And the third of all, which uh, might be one of my uh, uh, favorite features is that um, Alexandre was able to actually um, quantify the contribution of each one of the metals. And the reason of why that is so important, it's because to the, to the electronic structure, right? And the reason of why this is so important is that, for example, if you now look at the 50% silver and gold, for example, alloy, we do see that, for instance, at the gamma point, right, it is actually dominated by the gold contribution, meaning this darker color here. So the color scale have, have actually a meaning here, okay? It's not only to make it look pretty. So this became a very um, useful tool for us to correlate these measurements with the optical, this calculation, sorry, with the optical measurements. And, uh, and there's a lot of work that went into that, and I'll go into a whole lot of details here. But let me just uh, summarize by saying that um, we basically uh, could then quantify, right, that, that the, the threshold here for an interbanded transition should shift to longer wavelength as we increase the amount of gold. We go from red to black. And this is something that we could in the lab by doing transmission measurements, literally shining light, you know, to our thin film and glass and uh, see how much light is actually transmitted, correlate this to, I would say, in a semi-quantitative way. Okay? And uh, uh, this was very rewarding for us because then uh, we could... Uh, um, correlate again what you're seeing through the optical measurements in the lab and the, the permittivity rate of measurements, especially epsilon 2, and all the transitions that can happen within these alloys. Now, once we had a, um, a good idea of how the permittivity of those uh, uh, binary mixtures look like, we then went ahead and used those to um, mimic metallic nanostructures made out of these binary mixtures. And here we're quite interested in a one looking um, how both the near and the far field optical response of these binary mixtures would differ from a pure metal, meaning pure gold or pure silver, for example. So the way, let's see if this video is gonna play. The way we make these nanostructures in a scalable and very simple manner, basically we do the co-deposition while we rotate the substrate, and then we do a annealing process in an oxygen-free environment, and the voila, we have our nanoparticles. And this happens, and then we can study the light matter interaction. Um, they form due to de-wetting, essentially. Okay, and I can give you more details on that if anyone is interested, just let me know. But for now, oops, I'm not supposed to play again. Okay, so this is the result. So there is, what I'm showing you here is a scanning electron microscopy, an SM image of a, um, a large area, okay, of how these samples look like, and I like showing this large area precisely to recognize that it's not a, a, a super uniform a process, right? You can see here that we have a, some uh, incomplete dose of ripening, some of the particles, they kind of coalesce, but overall, the size distribution is, uh, I would say, fairly narrow, considering that this uh, method can be easily scaled up. It doesn't require um, any complex nanofabrication type of methods such as uh, EV lithography, right, of uh, any type of templated uh, type of a method as well. Now, then uh, um, at the time, um, we were actually interested in some of the fundamentals of the optical properties of these materials, and specifically, we wanted to see if we could tailor that uh, localized surface plasma resonance that I've shown to you in one of my first slides if we could shift the wavelength, essentially, in which we have a, a really high absorption and an enhancement of the electric field. So essentially what we did are a series of measurements that we call near-field scanning optical microscopy that I'm assuming that for, um, a lot of you folks in this audience, it, um, you're quite familiar with it, with all the, all the fantastic work that has been going on, right, in the physics department. So basically we do NSUM or SNOM, <laughs> depending on who you talk to, right? And essentially, 
what we do in this case, it's in transmission mode. So this is actually an enzyme based in a, in a probe that has an aperture. We shine a light through the probe and we can control the wavelength. And then as we raster scan this probe on the surface of these metallic structures, we also have an objective lens here at the bottom. And then we can essentially capture all light that is being transmitted, okay? So as we raster scan, we acquire information about the morphology. And here you're seeing very repetitive data, just trying to do that as we change the wavelength of this excitation light, nothing changes significantly on the topography, so that's good. And then here in this row, what you're seeing is precisely um, a scan, right, that results from all the light that is being transmitted, captured by an objective lens here underneath our sample. So essentially, what this is telling us is the following. Um, at 500 nanometers, it looks really dark, right? So a lot of the light is, uh, is, is just being absorbed. But then at 600 nanometers, you can actually uh, see here that we have a very high field um, around the particle and also underneath. I should say it's not inside. These are nanoscale measurements. Uh, they were in very good agreement with the macroscopic transmission measurements. So you can see here we have a peak in transmission around 600 nanometers, which translates very well with what's going on here at the nanoscale. And then if we want to now compare these measurements with optical simulation so that we can understand better what's going on, basically we can, in, a, in three dimensions, essentially uh, in numerically solve Maxwell's equation. So we can do that as a function of time, right? So um, we do what's called FBTD, finite uh, um, domain uh, time, uh, FBTD, yes. <laughs> finite time difference domain simulations. And basically, we can choose what light source we have and build a 3D space. So in this case, we're building one on a particle due to computational time, but naturally considering you know, the spatial distribution, the average size, and et cetera. So what you can see here in O is that we start seeing the quadrupole signature of our localized surface plasma resonance here. But then at 600, really we're at uh, uh, resonance where we see there is a very high field enhancement around and underneath the particle. So just as a a uh, point to clarify here, what we're seeing, it, even though I'm showing you a plane of view, right, it's actually the result of a screen, a monitor, if you want, that we added just underneath the metallic nanoparticles in the ITO layer that we have. So that's essentially one way of corroborating our experimental results and the, um, the, the optical simulations, right? We can essentially recreate in, a, in, the, in the computer, right, exactly what we have in our experiments. So that becomes very powerful. Now, um, in terms of an example with different materials, let me just briefly show to you here in one slide. Um, we have also looked into other metals. So for instance, the combination of a palladium and gold has shown to be very promising for both catalysis and sensing. So I'll show you one example in catalysis, primarily because it's also a collaboration with, uh, with Alexandre Rocha and uh, uh, also folks from our Army Research Lab back in Maryland. And essentially we could show that um, if we use a, a combination of palladium and gold, we can actually have a, a, a boost in the performance of uh, um, the ethanol oxidation, okay, reaction. So essentially, palladium gold as a as a as an alloy, this was known before, is a good a catalyst. But then here we could find, you know, what is the ideal chemical composition that can actually bring it to a minimum onset potential. And again, we explained that all that was going on in terms of the Venus structure of uh, these metallic uh, mixtures as well. Now, a completely different type of a device here that we could make, and if you see me looking down, I'm looking at the clock, okay, because I don't want to talk for more than 45 minutes. Sorry about that. But anyway, um, it's actually what we call a super absorber. So here's what happened. Um, we can design a material that it's actually going to absorb almost all light. And that's really interesting if you want to make us some uh, uh, sensing type of devices, right, or for beam steering and other type of, uh, of uh, situations. And basically what happens here, right, is that uh, we can design a material so that we have an impedance match between uh, the material itself and the medium. So essentially, we have uh, um, the electric and the magnetic resonances in this case, in this case, designed so that the bulk, the bulk effective impedance actually matches, it's equal to the impedance of free space. So if we do that as a result of these uh, um, criteria here that we have, basically the reflection that we have out of the material is essentially zero and almost all light will be absorbed. So I would like to have a perfect absorber, right? But I prefer calling super absorber. It's not really always that perfect. But anyway, uh, um, um, people in the field will call both ways. So then let me show to you what we've done. 
um, in a, in a really a, a neat collaboration uh, that we had with Mariana Dias. She was a postdoc in my group, and she did her PhD in uh, um, São Carlos, at the Universidade Federal de São Carlos. And uh, um, we met through an announcement that I posted at uh, the, the Brazilian um, Physical Society, and those were very productive two years. Now she's an assistant professor. We still work together. We're actually, this summer, we're working on a, a refractory metals for materials under extreme conditions. Um, and it's been a really, really cool. We still talk every week. It's been very productive. But anyway, what Mariama did um, when she teamed up with Chen back in Maryland was to actually then design and demonstrate experimentally a super absorber. So now at the, back then, uh, uh, she was, um, it tricked them and she said, okay, let's try to use materials that are actually earth abundant and low cost because I did not mention to you, right? However, <laughs> silver and gold are naturally um, very expensive materials. And then uh, she did a, this a material screening to see which options would work the best. So again, I use a scalable approach, no need for nano structure or anything, by using a bi layers um, design that is formed by a semiconductor material, silicon, and by the way, this works equally well with gallium arsenide, germanium, et cetera. In a, in a metal back reflector, she decided to look into one, how much absorption can we have? And two, how much can we tailor the wavelength in which this uh, maximum absorption occurs as a function of the thickness of this uh, semiconductor layer, which is D here. So this uh, second row here is showing a lot of data, I realize that, apologies, but it's telling us how much we can uh, shift the wavelength of the maximum absorption, again, as a function of uh, the thickness here of the silica. And what we can see is that the silver and gold work okay, but not so well. Chromium works a lot better. However, if you uh, spend a lot of time in the lab and making samples, you might know that uh, making high quality chromium is far from trivial. It's a material that actually has a lot of issues when we do uh, a sputtering deposition. Now we decided to then look again into earth abundant options such as aluminum and copper. And then she saw that copper looked much better. And once we combine the two, we could actually achieve 99% absorption. You know, we could obtain a motor wavelength type of response. Basically, again, depending on the, the thickness of the slab of silicon, right, we could choose and select exactly in which wavelength we wanted this absorption to occur. And then uh, we saw that uh, uh, here we could resolve all the optical modes. That's what these uh, M1 and 2, 3, 4 correspond to as a function, again, of the thickness of, uh, of uh, the silicon layer. So we can focus here on the, on the last row or you can see here this very well-defined um, optical modes and how high their absorption are, right? This is a very dark color here in our uh, scale means a really high absorption. And you could also see that as a function of angle, theta here, so now theta is the angle uh, um, that defines here um, the incidence of light with respect to the normal. We could see that up to 60 degrees, we still had a quite robust type of response. So uh, uh, we, we experimentally demonstrated that these uh, uh, um, simulations, they do make a lot of sense. For, this, for the experiments, we obtained maximum absorption of 80%. So I think there is definitely room to, to optimize right, these structures once we fabricated them. Now, uh, let me shift it here a little bit and tell about a different concept now, also related to photonics. A few years ago, I, I got very interested in actually making um, photonic uh, devices that can disappear after a stable operation. Maybe the motivation for that is that um, I like to say that my favorite color is a spectrum. So, <laughs> so I was really interested in making color pixels, but also make sure um, we could control, for example, in the case of uh, encryption, right? That can we have an information that if needed, right? We can make it disappear again. We can simply vanish. So can we make color pixels that will vanish? So that's what I call transient photonics. And let me show to you what we've done to, with that. So now we're looking to, um, Magnesium and magnesium oxide. This is uh, actually a combination of material that has a very unique property, and I'll tell you more about that in a second. Bear with me here. But the physics behind is quite simple. If you have a sandwich um, that is formed by two layers of a metal, magnesium, and uh, an inside layer of MgO, a dielectric, right? So first of all, if you have a metal and a dielectric, you have a platform for plasmonics. So that's all we need in theory. Second of all, what happens here is that um, depending on the thickness of this MGO layer, we have a fabricable um, resonance effect here that essentially allows us to engineer as a function of wavelength how much transmission we have at a certain point. 
So basically, depending on the thickness of this MGO layer here, we can make a color pixels in different um, hues. And here I'm showing to you a photograph in transmission mode. Basically, we use the light source in the back, so that's why you see this a, a very bright spots here. This essentially corresponds to the, the clamps, right, where we had a no uh, a metal dielectric being deposited, right, in a, on a glass substrate. And essentially, we could show that you can make colors that vary from blue all the way to a very deep red, a burgundy type of color. It's a scalable, right, because it's just a, a, a triple layer type of a structure. And you can see here the, the dots, uh, they correspond to the experiments, the solid line, our calculations. We have a very good agreement between both as expected and how much you can shift them. For the yellow, here I'll recognize that the full width half max of this uh, uh, transmission curve is a, a, a lot wider. The reason for that can be explained by this plot. So, so uh, we're going to go clockwise here, okay? So essentially, what you're seeing on the y-axis is the magnetism thickness as a function of the MGO1. It turns out that um, for all the samples, they are represented by these little white squares. So the students, they kept coming back and they say, okay, we think this is yellow, not big. No, this is pumpkin orange. This is a pumpkin orange. This is not really yellow. So then they proved to me that the window was extremely narrow to actually make yellow. So to make a vivid yellow, we have to decrease here the thickness of the magnesium layer. That's the reason why we have a broader Okay, for with half max here. But the point is that now, if you look at this uh, plot in B, we can uh, cover uh, quite well, I would say, the CIE chromaticity drop diagram, which is really important for color display. Now, um, the key feature here is that both magnesium and MGO, they are materials that etch in water. And they etch in water um, by producing a, a byproduct that is essentially magnesium um, hydroxide. And uh, that happens in ambient environment in ultra pH. So that's very useful. And a, a reminder here, um, and maybe a, a piece of information that some of you might not know, is that both magnesium and MGO are not only biodegradable, but actually biocompatible materials. So essentially, if we make uh, um, these uh, color pixels into a substrate, right, or a mechanical support that is biocompatible, we could, in principle, even swallow these devices if they Now, um, here's the, the chemical reactions that take place. After all, I did my, my undergrad in chemistry, right? And here's a sequence of photographs showing how, as a function of time, the color fades and fades within the last 10, 10 minutes. So as expected for the yellow pixel, that happens a little faster, right? Because we have a thinner magnesium top layer. And once we etch that away, we essentially cannot see uh, uh, the, the, the vivid right of color that is formed anymore. So this is something that we're continuing to work on and now making uh, metallic nanostructures out of those and a, a changing a chirality, you know, as a function of etching, et cetera. So it becomes a, a way of making a dynamic, although irreversible, in this case, a zero power type of a photonic devices. And uh, this final slide is in this topic is showing to us um, uh, how robust the colors are as a function of angle, okay? So basically you can see here how much they change as you change the angle of incidence. Now, um, I will go ahead and uh, uh, spend uh, uh, the, the next uh, 15 minutes or so talking about the, the second topic, which is quite different. So I also have students that are, that are working on uh, um, solar cell materials and uh, uh, specifically trying to understand uh, um, what is happening at the nanoscale and what are the, the, the physical and chemical processes that can help us understand why and how materials are degrading specifically. So the very brief introduction here is that, uh, well, I think this number is uh, somewhat unupdated. I think it's 16 terawatt in power almost now. So basically we consume an average of around the 15, 16 terawatt in power. And uh, um, when, I, when I went to, to, to Pasadena for my postdoc, it was actually to work on solar cell materials. And at that time there was a boom in the research in this topic in, in the US. And that was a very exciting time. And uh, back then I was working with the um, 3.5 multi-junction, so 3.5 semiconductor multi-junction solar cells for space application, a very different type of a, of a system. And then um, after when I was in my uh, solo career, right, I changed the type of material, and I'll tell a little bit about that. Now, one aspect that I think we can all agree is that uh, we definitely want a, a photovoltaic or a solar cell, right, a photovoltaic device that is high efficiency. So basically, if you look into the current voltage characteristic here of a device, what we want is to make sure we have a <clears throat> quite a bit of output power, right, which is going to be essentially be operating your solar cell device on the forward bias here, in this black point, and then naturally depending on what is the input power, if you divide the output by the input power, we have the efficiency. 
So the efficiency is defined here with this equation, and it's essentially a contribution of the Schwarz circuit current, which is uh, um, the, the, this point, the blue point here on the y-axis of the plot, the open circuit voltage, which is the x-axis here in green, the field factor, which tells us how square this curve is, and this matters a lot in engineering uh, detail here, because it tells us how much a shunt and series resistance we have in those devices, and I won't get into details on that because this is a physics audience. Anyway, divided by the input power, which can be one sun illumination, so that's 100 milliwatts per centimeter squared. That could be um, 100 suns if you're in space, right? 350 suns. So naturally, for, uh, from the point of view of calibration, we care a lot about what is the input power. But again, what we want is to have a really high, if possible, short circuit current and voltage at the same time. There is a correlation between the two. You cannot, uh, uh, there's a sweet spot, actually, that depends a lot on the bend gap of the material so that we can achieve uh, this balance. And uh, when we look now at this very busy and uh, informative plot from the National Renewable Energy Lab, what we do see here is the record, the word record, um, power conversion efficiency for the different solar cell technologies that are available out there. And then um, what I would like to focus in my talk today is um, on a perovskite solar cell. So it's this little um, red dot here painted in yellow. So you can see here how it has had a very steep slope and positive slope naturally, and how it's been evolved as a function of time. You can also see that the very first solar cell record was recorded back in uh, 2013. So it's a very recent field, right? And uh, within uh, the, the lifetime of a PhD student, within uh, five years, uh, four to five years, we could see that the efficiency here of these record devices, they were very comparable to silicon. And silicon is, um, dominates the photovoltaic market. It actually represents 90% uh, of the market. So if you can do something that can do one as good as silicon, but it's very low cost, or two can be added to silicon in a dual junction type of configuration. And if we could increase the efficiency of silicon in let's say two, 3%, that could revolutionize the market. So let me just show to you one of the key points that uh, um, before we started working on perovskite solar cells were very intrigued is the fact that if we're not dealing with epitaxial materials, and I'm with Pulsar um, I have a lot of work on, a, on a epitaxial semiconductors, right? But if we're dealing with the polycrystalline and massive materials, if you want, that are low cost and therefore the advantage, um, if we take a closer look, we can see that they're formed by a lot of grains, right, that have interfaces and defects. So at the time, um, and it's used the case, right, it has been reported that uh, uh, by far the, the highest power conversion efficiency they occur in materials that are epitaxial. And the reason for that is because every one of those interfaces and defects, they can easily act as a center for non-radiative recombination. So we shine light, excite an electron from the fundamental to the excited state, right? But once it decays, it can decay by emitting a photon or not. If it's not, it's non-radiative uh, recombination. Then we're talking about either OJ recombination or shortly red hole, right? All these different processes. If you took a class in solid state uh, devices, right? You probably heard about those. And essentially, there's definitely a consensus, right, that we want to make sure we minimize non-radiative recombination. So um, one of the questions that we had is, okay, what is the contribution of each one of these interfaces and boundaries in our defects overall to um, this non-radiative recombination rate? And it turns out that the radiative recombination rate is actually directly proportional to the open circuit voltage of the cell. So if you could come up with a way of a mapping voltage locally, right, that, that would be very informative because these are, uh, processes are all connected to the physical quantity of open circuit voltage. And the reason of why we care so much about the open circuit voltage is because when you look at all the work that has been done in the field, um, for all the materials, the short circuit current has really already achieved the limit of what it could be theoretically. However, for the open circuit voltage that is really, um, a gap here on a, um, the best that has been done and what it should be theoretical. So what we stable shown here is that, for example, for uh, different types of solar cell materials that are made out of uh, uh, polycrystalline uh, structures, we can see that the theoretical VOC is quite higher than at the maximum VOC achieved open circuit voltage. So there's a gap here, um, to me, represented at a time an opportunity to try to understand, hold on, where exactly is the VOC low? And then how can we design better electronic materials in that sense? So then uh, there are different ways of uh, actually uh, mapping what we call the figures of merit of electronic materials. 
I won't get into a lot of details of the time, but electrons can be used as the excitation source. If we use electrons, I would say the main uh, word of caution is that with one electron, we can excite thousands of electron hole pairs. So if we want to um, compare nanoscale measurements with the macroscopic ones, we probably have to do Monte Carlo simulations of the trajectory of the electron within the material. However, if we use a photons as our excitation source, we can do a one-to-one -one comparison as long as we calibrate the system properly and we take into consideration uh, the, the difference right, in a scale that we're dealing with both at a nanoscale regime and the macroscopic regime where I showed you that light ID curve. So in essence, the light ID curve that I showed you is super informative, right? It tells us the average behavior of the, the, the solar cell, but it doesn't resolve spatially the contribution of each one of those uh, uh, um, mesoscale constructs, right? And uh, another thing that I want to say is that we actually don't need to have a, a um, atomic scale resolution here. Uh, so for those that do scanning tunneling uh, um, microscopy, and I've done that back in my PhD in the synchrotron lab for a while, um, it's a super cool, neat technique, no doubt. But here we actually do not need it to have atomic scale resolution. So we're dealing with uh, um, uh, processes that are happening at the mesoscale. We're interested in the contribution of uh, thousands of atoms, right? Uh, so we're talking about length scale between uh, 5 nanometers and 100, essentially. So let me focus on the work that we've been doing in mapping locally the open circuit voltage. And we've done that by using a technique called the Kelvin probe of force microscopy. So uh, Bernard, the right, the Magus and others do a lot of scanning probe microscopy uh, based on uh, um, atomic force microscopy, right, the AFM. So I'm sure uh, a lot of this, the grad students are quite familiar with the method. I'll tell you that um, overall, Right, uh, we became very interested in uh, performing nanospectroscopy in PV materials, essentially looking at light matter interactions on these materials. So, the, the overall uh, uh, motivation here is that um, if you're talking to consumers, right, or to, to, to people on the streets and you want to convince them to put the solar panels on their roof, they're going to say, okay, I want to make sure the material is reliable. Turns out that at the, the nanoscale, right, there has been a lot of work already correlating the morphology of these materials with the current. So there's a very good understanding of that. But a few years ago, we noticed that uh, what was missing was actually a method to um, image and uh, quantify the open circuit voltage here locally and making a connection between uh, this open circuit voltage and the morphology of those grains. So that then we can move on to the next step, right? And design, ah, I don't know, I placed too high, sorry, and design better materials. So basically, the work that uh, um, Elizabeth and, uh, and uh, Joe Garrett did back on their grad school was to um, the following. We basically came up with a way of uh, uh, mapping locally the open circuit voltage, and I'm running out of time, so we'll go, go a little bit fast on that. And the uh, Kelvin probe force microscopy essentially measures the difference in work function between a, a conductive tip and the surface of a sample. So what we did that was different, I would say, is that um, we actually decided to do these measurements not only under illumination, but actually grounded the tip with respect to the um, metal contact that we have in our device. So once we did that, we're still measuring a difference in work function between uh, the tip now under illumination, the surface of the sample. However, if you subtract the two signals, we actually have uh, the splitting of the quasi Fermi level, which is directly proportional to our open circuit voltage. So if we do that, we can actually now uh, um, resolve and quantify uh, how much contribution we have to the VOC at the nanoscale. So there's a lot of calibration that goes into making those statements. I would just summarize them by these equations and uh, telling you that um, overall, one of the primary differences is that at the nanoscale, we are focusing light in this case and we are exciting a very small volume of carriers. And uh, at the same time, we have the dark current contribution of the entire device. And dark current is something right we have for any type of electronic device. Right. If you buy a spectrometer, you want to know what is the dark current, right? So um, this type of method is actually valid, I would say, to diagnose any type of optoelectronic device. So then we apply this technique to a series of inorganic materials. I will skip that and just show to you that uh, um, we then realized that we could uh, go ahead and uh, leverage this method to actually um, try to investigate what was going on on perovskites. And I mentioned to you that the perovskites, they are they have efficiency comparable to silicon. However, they are very unstable. So these uh, uh, halide, the metal halide perovskites, they're a mixture of an organic and an inorganic type of material. They have this structure that is an ABX3 type. So you can see here color coded. We have the inorganic large molecule here, and sometimes a mixture of this inorganic molecule and some uh, um, 
cations like cesium or rubidium that sits here in the center of this octahedra, and then an overall structure. And then we have the metal cation, usually lead, which is toxic, but I won't get into details into that. They are most extremely small, less than what we have on a battery, a nitro play battery. And then we have the highlight anion here, um, iodine or bromine or chlorine. So anyway, this is how the solar shells look like. If, if you do a cross section here, you can see it's a thin film. It absorbs light extremely well, as well as gamma arsenide, which is fantastic, but it changes. And it changes very quickly. The changes that we see, they happen in a function of a second. So what this plot here shows, for example, how the short circuit current and the efficiency, or in this case, the it changes and decays as a function of a seconds once we illuminate this device. So it's a great material except that uh, um, it degrades. That's the irony. So in the pursuit of understanding what's going on, we then decided to apply that scanning probe microscopy method. In parallel, we're doing a lot of uh, um, optical measurements on those materials and looking to what drives instability. I don't have much time, but I just want to say this is actually working collaboration with Bernardo Neves. Uh, from your department who was doing sabbatical in my group and was a, a very productive time. I'm really glad he could join us. And also on a Flavia Nogueira at Uni Company in the chemistry department. And here basically we've shown how much history is as we have once we um, submit these thin films to um, different levels of humidity that goes to a very long story that I don't have to talk about. But let me just show to you, I'm not gonna put this video. Uh, sorry, I'm not gonna put this video. Anyway, but the big picture here is the following. Um, the influence of each one of those stressors, temperature, light, humidity, oxygen, and bias, they cause a changes to the material and to the device. Some of them are reversible, others are irreversible. So then we applied that scanning probe microscopy method that I mentioned to you. And um, what we could do is to first of all, see that there was a lot of spatial variation in the local open circuit voltage, even within one grain, under one sun illumination. Then we're wondering what's causing that. Turns out, scanning probe microscopy is very slow, right? You need to have a lot of patience to deal with that. But then what we did, and Joe Garrett was uh, fantastic here, he essentially came up with a method that allowed us to scan the voltage local more than 100 times faster. So then every scanner took place in actually only 16 seconds instead of the usual 25 minutes. And once he did that, we could then in real time track the changes that are happening in the voltage. So basically, that's what this slide is summarizing. If you look into um, a representative region here of these perovskites under dark conditions, we see the distribution and voltage that we have. Once we illuminate with one sun, we can see the photo voltage is generated as expected, and that sustains as long as light is on. And then as we turn the light off, we can see the evolution of the system towards equilibrium. So basically, I'll skip this slide. Here's what's happening. In order to explain the existence of a residual voltage, we essentially have to add a term here that corresponds to um, ionic motion, motion of ions literally within this material. We have to add this term to the diode equation so that it uh, has a physical meaning. It turns out this is something, this ion motion, that's something that people have observed uh, prior to our work, I would say in snapshots before and after eliminating this, the, the material. But in this case, we could actually track in real time and quantify that. So essentially, once you shine light, um, the electrons, they fill in the trapped state. And then what we see is essentially the, the motion of a iodine away from these electrons. And once we turn the light back off, we can see them coming back. So essentially we see them coming back. So this ion motion is very asymmetric and it takes place in a time scale of a seconds, which is something very slow, right? Compared to other uh, physical processes that we have. And therefore we could resolve uh, uh, precisely, right? How much ion motion we have in these materials. So as I'm running out of time, I'll say that now we are uh, continuing to do a lot of uh, 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 this work on, a, on a imaging, right, at the nanoscale dynamic processes and perovskites. At the same time, we are very interested in looking to what are the, um, the pathways here to recover this device and material. And we have been doing that by using machine learning, so I don't have time to talk about that. This is new work from a, a, a new grad student, Magna, that has been essentially looking to how we can use machine learning and the high throughput of measurements to uh, do not only composition and screening, but actually focusing more on the stability and the for the development of materials and devices. So with that, I will go ahead and I'll stop because I've been talking for 49 minutes and I'd like to thank uh, um, the audience very much for hanging out here via Zoom. I know everybody's tired of Zoom meetings and I'd like to just uh, wrap up by thanking um, my students. They basically rock 
um, and a post doc that we have in the group right now. And again, I'm saying that we're very welcome to collaborations if anyone is interested in that, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Obrigada, Marina. Muito, muito trabalho interessante, né? Vou convidar o pessoal para ligar o microfone para a gente agradecer a Marina. E a gente abre para perguntas agora. Tem uma pergunta do Ado, que já levantou a mão. Ado, por favor. Marina, obrigado pelo seminário. É, eu, eu fiquei surpreso de ver que eu não sabia que os, vamos dizer assim, a eficiência do, dos, dos fotovoltaicos já está na casa de 40%, quase 50%. Você podia me explicar por que que, assim, eu achava que o Perovisquita era um grande, um grande assim, trunfo e, e eu vejo no seu gráfico que ele está lá embaixo, né? Qual que é a grande procura? Os, os 47,1% que você mostra aí já não é uma solução ou é uma questão de preço? O, o que que está por trás dessa corrida? Certo, certo. Obrigada, Ado. Então, você tem toda a razão nos seus comentários. É, é, primeiro, é, é, você é um ótimo observador. Então, o que, é que acontece com esse 47% aqui? De fato, é, essas células solares, elas na verdade correspondem a, a células que têm multijunções. Então, é sem um stack, nesse caso, seis junções. Então, não é só uma, uma junção PN, certo? Você tem seis, é uma série de materiais, três sim. É, é, galho, um galho marcenide, galho marcenide, todas essas combinações de ternário e quaternário que você pode colocar, eles otimizam o, o gap do material e a gente faz um stack de maneira que o material que tem o maior band gap fica em cima, porque aí a luz que tem, não tem tanta energia filtrada, certo? Passa, na verdade, é transmitida e absorvida pela próxima junção PN, e so for, so for. Você vai fazendo esse step. Agora, tem outro detalhe. Note que aqui, esse númerozinho entre parênteses tem um significado enorme. 146 vezes, 143 vezes. Isso é o um número de sóis. Então, o que acontece aqui? O, o power input que eu mostrei, deixa eu ver se é aqui. Esse, esse, o que acontece é que esse, esse power input aqui vai ser muito mais alto, certo? O power output também. Mas, mas a gente ganha eficiência pela seguinte razão. A voltagem, o, o circuito de voltagem aberta, na verdade, é, cresce de forma logarítmica. Então, a gente não ganha nada no power output com relação à a, a corrente. Mas a gente ganha numa escala log se a gente aumentar a intensidade e o número de sóis na voltagem. Se você aumentar muito... Aí termina acontecendo um problema que é o fio factor termina sofrendo. Você começa a ter problemas de resistência na série, na, na, no seu dispositivo. Mas se o material for de muita alta qualidade, se você fizer toda aquela optimização, que eu não curto tanto, você, você aí, na verdade, consegue chegar no, nesse tipo de dispositivo. Agora, comentário que você fez, então, isso é uma solução? Depende da aplicação, certo? Porque, no caso aqui, é, para esses, é, esses, essas células solares de multijunção, elas são extremamente... Um, é o que a gente utiliza basicamente pela NASA, certo? É, é triple junction normalmente a NASA. Então, peço para a aplicação espacial, é, é, sem dúvida funciona. Você também pode colocar no seu telhado, só que não tem jeito você vai querer pagar isso tudo. Então, é o preço. Certo? Porque para você mandar é, painel solar para o espaço, eu imagino, ninguém vai querer mandar silício, certo? Porque silício é, é um material de band gap indireto, certo? Então, você precisa de dezenas de microns para você absorver 70% de luz. Em comparação com a semente de galho, você só precisa de 2.73 microns, você já absorve mais de 90%. E mandar um quilo de material para o espaço é quanto? 40 mil dólares, algo desse tipo. Então, esquece, ninguém vai querer mandar silício, certo? Mas então, voltando às perovisquitas aqui que você falou, de fato é um material muito promissor. O ponto aqui é que as células elas não são estáveis. Então, tem testes agora com um ano, agora as empresas estão começando a tentar fazer esses dispositivos, mas o que acontece é que, imagine o seguinte, se você consegue fazer uma prova escrita que se a gente adicionar num design de, de junção dupla ao silício, imagine se a gente conseguisse aumentar a eficiência do silício em 5%, só que isso é 90% do mercado. E como você faz, eu não mencionei isso, desculpa, mas a, a maneira que as pessoas fazem para o site é, é muito barata, é simple. Eu, inclusive, tenho uma, um laboratório agora que eu ensino para os estudantes de graduação, que a gente faz célula para, acho que, três horas. 
Então, você consegue fazer muito rápido. Agora, eu digo para eles, volta semana que vem e fecha de novo. Nenhum dos seus funcionários ficam arrasados. Né? Porque... <risos> só que esse é que é o problema, entendeu? Então, é muito rápido e fácil de você fazer e barato, só que o material degrada. Mas, então, esse, esse ponto aqui alto que você viu são as multijunctions. É, são várias junções, o que é extremamente é, caro. Entendi. Obrigado, Marina. Mais perguntas, comentários? Eu ia perguntar justamente das perovisquistas, então não, não tem nada comercial ainda, é só pesquisa, porque é muito instável. Na é verdade, no ano passado, 2020, uma empresa chamada Oxford PV, que é uma spin-off da Universidade de Oxford, eles disseram que iam ter painéis antes do final do ano, mas a pandemia atrasou tudo, então agora eles estão dizendo que vai ser esse ano. Mas a ideia não é um painel só de perovisquita, mas perovisquita em silício. Então, todo ano é o ano que vai acontecer, né? E todo ano há uma expectativa na comunidade científica que as perovisquitas podem ganhar um prêmio Nobel de Química, mas aí... Ah, é? Ah, é, sempre tem. É. Tá. É, tem uma pergunta. Iago, por favor. Oi. É, então, eu queria perguntar para a Marina, ela mostrou um, um trabalho de 2016, onde tem a função dielétrica do, do ouro e da prata. É. E aí eu queria saber, porque eu cheguei a fazer uns cálculos via DFT, né, até mesmo tomando esse trabalho como base, quando eu encontro uma anisotropia na função dielétrica para o 50-50, para esse da letra C, o que eu deveria fazer para apresentar esses resultados? Eu deveria fazer uma média ou deveria ah, escolher uma direção específica que, que mais se aproximasse ali dos resultados experimentais? Ok. Ah, Iago, acho que não tem uma resposta absoluta para a sua pergunta. <risos> Sinceramente, eu acho que não tem uma resposta absoluta. Um, eu, eu, a média, bom, a média sempre... É sempre informativo, né, a média, mas eu particularmente acho que, que, que... Você pode mostrar os dois, não? Eu acho que... Porque eu acho que a média você vai terminar convoluindo parte da informação que, que os seus cálculos de DFT estão mostrando, né? Que não é uma simetria completa, apesar da composição química ser equivalente, 50% de um e de outro. Então, pessoalmente, eu acho que, que se você consegue é, decovoluir a contribuição de cada um deles é um ponto a mais que você está tá informando né, para a comunidade científica. Mas eu não acho que tem resposta absoluta para a sua pergunta. Tá, tá bom. Obrigado. Mais alguém? Mais alguma pergunta, comentário? Marina, você quer contar um pouquinho para os estudantes aí como é que é o seu laboratório? Você que faz o crescimento, depois faz a caracterização, depende. tudo? Tem conexão com outros laboratórios? Como é que é? Certo, depende. Então, é, é, pois é, então primeiro, desculpa por não ter agradecido no final a todos os colaboradores. É, é, a gente colabora com gente de, 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 o mundo todo, assim, não todo mundo, claro, mas de, 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 de continentes diferentes. Tem, é, então, na, na área de fotônica, a gente faz material e a gente faz toda a caracterização e os, e, e os cálculos óticos, eu não mostrei, mas tem muita simulação ótica que a gente faz também, o que é, é razoavelmente, é, 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 eu diria fácil, comparado com os cálculos que você faz, Carol. Então, a parte de cálculo de estrutura eletrônica, e é que a gente fala agora com o Alexandre, um, uhum. na parte de perovas fitas de célula solar em geral, tem outros materiais, mas recentemente, nos últimos 3, 4 anos, a gente só tem trabalhado com perovas fitas na parte de célula solar, a gente colabora com outras pessoas nos Estados Unidos, na Georgia Tech, a gente colabora com o pessoal na Austrália, o que eu achei que foi muito legal porque é, em Cambridge, e foi assim que uma das minhas ex-estudantes, Elizabeth, ela depois virou pós-doc em Cambridge, certo? O pessoal na Austrália está sempre também perguntando se, se tem alguém que quer trabalhar com eles. É, na Alemanha... Mas isso é para caracterizar, então eles viajam com as amostras para caracterizar, não? Eles fazem as amostras, desculpe, mandam para a gente um vácuo e... É o maior... <risos> ah, então vocês não fazem as amostras? As perovisquitas, não. As ah, perovisquitas, não. É, nas perovisquitas, não. A gente colabora muito com o pessoal em Berlim. O Antônio Abate, ele é fantástico também. Na Austrália, o pessoal em Canberra. Na Austrália National University, com o Tom White. Também ótimo, ótimo. E a gente quase fechou um artigo. 
Então, então é, eles, na verdade, fazem as amostras na casa para os filhos. A gente poderia fazer, eu acho que nada impede, mas é uma questão de que um, fazer um dispositivo ruim é fácil, fazer um dispositivo muito bom é muito difícil. Uhum. Eu tenho total respeito, entendeu? Pelo pessoal que faz dispositivos. E eu acho que ali também é uma questão de que não dá para a gente ser expert em tudo, né? Então, a gente meio que escolheu focalizar nessa parte de espectroscopia, de é, caracterização na escala nanométrica, mas é mais uma escolha. Nesse... Então, essas são as montagens que você tem no laboratório, é isso? Mais essa parte de espectroscopia. É. E aí é. o resto é, é colaborações. As medidas óticas, assim. Então, não deu tempo de falar, mas, por exemplo, quando o Bernardo estava ah, no grupo da gente fazendo sabática, a gente começou a fazer um trabalho com, com medida ótica, especialmente, e não medida elétrica, mas primeiramente porque nessa época eu já estava interessada em utilizar inteligência artificial para a gente tentar entender é, é, qual, é, qual é a contribuição de cada um dos fatores, temperatura, umidade, na resposta de material, é, filme fino somente, e depois dispositivo. Então, a gente faz muita medida de fotoluminescência, de iluminescência lifetime, tempo de vida. A elipsometria também é bom, porque também é high throughput, qualquer coisa que você pode medir muito e rápido. E aí, Megan, que está agora no segundo ano, ela é fantástica em coding. Então, hum. ela já montou toda a parte de machine learning <risos> que precisava. E aí, agora que a gente está fazendo, é medindo muito, porque você tem que ter muito input, né? E eu admito, tem muito interesse agora nessa parte da inteligência artificial e tem muito em, 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 emprego nisso, então a gente está bem interessado. Também porque não dá para você fazer é, tentativa e erro, né? Nesse caso, porque a, a, o número de possibilidades é enorme. Então, uhum. nesse aspecto, eu acho que a inteligência artificial é bem útil. Ah, legal. E claro que a gente usa a sala limpa, a gente também usa Stanford, a gente usa Berkeley, então tem um aluno que vai para Berkeley, agora para fazer as amostras de magnésio do, da parte de fotônica transiente. Em Stanford a gente usa um, algumas das técnicas, uma técnica na verdade, primeiramente, num projeto sobre baterias, que eu não falei, um aluno é doutorado que trabalha com bateria de estado sólido, então a gente também faz um pouco disso. Muita coisa. É, é bom que tem as estruturas próximas, né? Dá para aproveitar aí, por exemplo, só na Califórnia tem várias coisas, vários laboratórios. E... Legal. É, o Ado que deixou um recado aqui, parabéns Marino, obrigado e até a próxima. Então, acho que ele saiu. Mais alguma pergunta, comentário? Então vou agradecer novamente a, a Marina. Valeu demais, Marina. Eu vou encerrar a gravação e aí, se alguém quiser fazer alguma pergunta... O Iago está com a mão levantada, mas eu suponho que tenha sido a pergunta que ele já fez, né? Talvez ele tenha esquecido. Ah, tá. Não, não, é. Foi a pergunta Você que quer fazer fiz. outra pergunta? Se você quiser, fica à vontade. Não, não. Não, né? Foi a pergunta. Tá bom. Então, vou encerrar e aí, se alguém quiser mais fazer algum comentário, depois do de oficialmente encerrado, às vezes o pessoal fica mais à vontade. Então, peraí. Então, obrigada, Marina.